There is a lot to talk about, as Marvin said. So without further ado, let me get started. And after COVID, you would think the world would be due for a rest. But as John Calvin said, there's no rest for the wicked. And this year has been just as tumultuous as the last few years, what with you can see on the front pages of the newspapers in this cartoon, Ukraine and climate change and energy bills, the rising cost of living, just to name a few. And that's also reflected in markets. This is a very dense table. Uh, what it shows is the return every year of stocks. That's the column that says S&P and bonds. Uh, that's the column that says 10-year. And then a 60-40 portfolio, which means a portfolio that's invested in stocks, 60% invested in stocks and 40% invested in bonds. There's three quick observations that I'd like to make. The first is if you look at the bottom right, this year has been unique because never before were both stocks and bonds down more than 10%. The second thing is there were some other years when both stocks and bonds were down, but not many. They're the ones highlighted in orange, 1931, 41, 69, and 2018. If we look at what happened in the years that followed each, only one of them was down, 1932. That was literally the worst year for the economy ever, at the bottom of the Great Depression. And even there, your bonds went up. What kept, what, what kept going down were stocks. So a 60-40 portfolio was down 1.7% in 1932, which actually isn't bad for the worst year for the economy on record. Then the third observation is going back to the bottom right. You'll see 10-year treasury returns were down last year by 4.4%. And this year, unless somehow they rise 15.1%, which is extremely unlikely, they're also going to be down. There were two other times when bond yields fell for two years in a row. Uh, if you look in the middle, you'll see 1955, 56, 1958, 59. But I can tell you that there were never three down years in a row for bonds, not only going back to 1928, which is what this table does, but with bonds, we can actually go back to the 18th century. We have that data and over 200 years of data and never were bonds down three years in a row. So the point to make is markets have already priced a lot of bad news in. But just by looking at these numbers, history is on the side of it getting better. Uh, and there's a few reasons why that could be the case too. The reason why stocks and bonds are down a lot this year is because of interest rates. Nobody expected the Federal Reserve to raise rates so much. One reason is that Jerome Powell is a very rich man far richer than any central bank chairman ever was. Why would he want to hurt his own portfolio? That was one way of thinking, but that didn't stop him. And we can see that he's raised rates the most this year since the early 1980s. And the reason is because inflation is the highest it's been since the early 1980s. So if we know where inflation is going, we will know where interest rates are going. And if we know where interest rates are going, we will know where stock and bond prices are going. Let me therefore show you where we think inflation is going and we think it's going down. One reason is money supply, as simple as it sounds, the more money there is sloshing around, the more it drives up prices. Uh, the blue line in this chart is money supply growth. It has collapsed and, well, that's interest rates have gone up, by the way. When interest rates are high, people tend to keep their money in the bank and therefore less money supply. Anyway, uh, that line has been pushed forward by nine months to show you it has a pretty good track record for leading inflation. Then let's look at another chart. The prices paid component of the manufacturing survey shows what factories are paying for their materials. And it's been pushed forward by three months in this chart. It's the blue line. It has a pretty good track record for leading inflation too. 
Citibank run what they call an inflation surprise index. That's the blue line here. And it has a good track record, not so much for leading inflation because I didn't push it forward, just for moving in line with inflation. Anyway, you can see it's collapsed. So unless the relationship between these two things, for some mysterious reason, has broken down, inflation should come down too. And indeed, when we look at the average of previous inflation cycles since World War II and compare that average to the current cycle, it's interesting to see that inflation is peaking right where it did in those past cycles too, on average. Now, if we look at where the growth in prices is still rising, it's not commodities, blue line is commodities. You might have seen the oil price just went below $80 yesterday. Most commodity prices are actually lower than where they were before Russia invaded Ukraine. So it's not commodities that are our problem anymore. Problem is the services prices. The services are where the prices are still rising. And the really big service item is on the far left, shelter, is a third of the entire inflation basket. What is shelter? Well, it's real estate. And half of it is measured by the price of real estate. The other half is measured by the rents that people who live in the real estate pay. And we think that this will start to come down. One reason is because the interest rate has gone up a lot. So mortgage rates have also gone up a lot. In fact, they've more than doubled from 3% a year ago to 7% today. So the average mortgage that was $2,000 a month a year ago is $3,100 a month today. And if we compare that to people's incomes, it means it's very expensive. The average person who's buying the average new house today would have to use 95 hours of their monthly wages paying off a mortgage. Well, the average American only works 136 hours a month. So that's something like 70% of their wages which of course nobody can do. So no surprise that house prices are falling. Uh, purple line on the top shows that they are moving down this year. They were 8%, uh, they were 8%, excuse me, lower than what they were at their peak in the summer. Now I said the other half of the way that uh, the uh, real estate is measured in the inflation basket is rents. Asking rents, if we look at the bottom right of this chart, saw their largest decrease in history in October. Well, admittedly, the history only goes back to 2017. It's not very long, but these should keep going down because like mortgages, rents are very expensive today. The average American has to spend 64 hours of their monthly wages on rent on average, which once again, that's too much given they only work 138 hours a month. So, so we think inflation is going to keep coming down and therefore the Federal Reserve won't raise rates so much. Well, the whole world has been impacted by inflation. Other central banks have been raising rates, as you can see here, but now they've started to cool down their rate hikes. Among the uh, so-called Anglo-Saxon central banks, uh, what started off the, the slower pace of tightening was the Australians in September. And then the Canadians last month, they said they weren't gonna raise rates so much. And these Anglo-Saxon central banks have tended to move in a pack if you look back in history. Well, not just the Anglo-Saxon banks, here you can see central banks all over the world <clears throat> raised rates a lot, but they're starting to slow the pace of that rate hike. They're starting to slow it down because they don't want to drive the world economy into a big recession, which is what would happen if they kept, kept raising rates so much. So, so we think the Federal Reserve will follow those other central banks and decelerate. And actually our forecast is the dotted blue line we see one more 50 basis point hike at the Federal Reserve's meeting in December. And then we see no rate hikes until in April where we're actually looking for a rate cut. That's a bit different from what the Federal Reserve has been indicating. It's been indicating that it will raise rates about another 100 basis points. So that's what the futures market is pricing in too. That's the brown line. We beg to differ because we think by the beginning of next year, there will be ample signs that inflation is coming down. And so the Fed won't need to keep on hiking. 
you may say that it's very brave to contradict the Fed, but not really. They're only human like all of us. And everybody makes mistakes, including the 15 members of the Federal Reserve who vote on interest rates. Uh, four times a year, those 15 people contribute their forecast for what they think the economy is going to look like and interest rates will look like in the future. And the table on the left shows that in December last year, the average of those 15 uh, members saw the Fed funds rate. That's the interest rate the Federal Reserve sets that influences all other interest rates. They saw it at 0.9% by the end of this year. So that's highlighted in brown at the bottom, uh, left bottom. Well, I can tell you, we're not even at the end of the year yet, and the Fed funds rate is already at 4%, not 0.9. So who's to say the forecast they made in September for the end of next year, that's on the right-hand side, 4.6%. Who's to say that's going to be right? And I would just say, like the forecast they made in December last year, which was far too low, the forecast they made in September this year is probably going to prove to be far too high. And we're going to see that revised down when the next set of forecasts gets released at their meeting in December, because it doesn't need to be so high if inflation is coming down. So we'll have to see who's right and who's wrong. Uh, one thing I can tell you in the meantime is the two-year treasury yield is a canary in the coal mine because each of these bars shows how many days came before or after, uh, how many days before or after the last interest rate hike did the two-year treasury yield peak in previous rate hike cycles. Um, and it peaked somewhere around you know, a month and a half to uh, just a few days after uh, each of those previous uh, Federal Reserve rate hike cycles. So, so here's the two-year treasury yield. I can't say for sure if it's peaked or not. What we'd really need is to see it break the, bottom, the dotted brown line uh, to be sure that it's broken. But if it just goes sideways, it will break through that dotted brown line by late December or early January. One thing I can say for sure that has peaked though is the dollar. And uh, here is the dollar um, and it's uh, important for financial markets. It's a big problem when the dollar is going up. Each of the gray lines is what the dollar did from January to December in each of the last 21 years. You can see there's no real seasonal trend, but the point is the dollar this year was supercharged. It's the blue line. At one point in September, it was the best return it's ever seen in any year over the last 22 years, and now it's not. Another way we can look at it is to compare the dollar today with the dollar on this day last year, and then the dollar yesterday compared to what it was uh, on the same day last year, et cetera, et cetera. We call that the 12 month rolling rate of change. That's what we're looking at here. And you can see almost never did the dollar rise more than 20% on a year on year basis. It only happened three times before, 1985, 2008, 2015. And in all of those times, it didn't stay so high for very long. So this year in late September, the dollar was up 21% over late September last year. Now you can see that rate of change has decelerated. It's not going up so fast anymore. In fact, it's, it's coming down. And the dollar is very expensive. Uh, one way you can tell that is by looking at the price of something that you could buy anywhere in the world and compare it in different cities around the world. Uh, like a Big Mac hamburger. How much is a Big Mac in Los Angeles or in London or Singapore or Tokyo? And here you can see on that basis, we call that purchasing power parity. The dollar is expensive. One last thing just for fun is magazine covers. Sometimes when you see things on the front of a magazine, it's actually time to do the opposite. Take, for example, these magazine covers. Well, here were the front pages of two important magazines last month. Here's another one from last year. Uh, and by the way, those things, the cryptocurrencies, the fact they are going to become highly regulated in light of what's happened, with this company FTX, I think will bring interest back into stocks and probably gold. 
which was seen as sort of the traditional alternative to stocks and bonds. And a lot of the energy was taken out of stocks and gold by these cryptocurrencies, particularly their appeal to younger people. And that's going to take quite a long time to come back probably. Well, here's another sign the dollars peaked. The bank robbers saying, can you make it in dollars? And the reason why it's so important for markets is in this chart, what I've done is I took the dollar index in blue, but I turned it upside down. In other words, the dollar has been going up over the last 12 months. And we can see the more it's gone up, the more world stocks have gone down. They move in pretty much lockstep the opposite direction from each other. So if you think the dollar is no longer going to go up, that is a good thing for stocks. Uh, stocks bounced very nicely off their 200 week moving average, which is an important technical indicator. If you look at the bottom left in 2007, they were unable to do that. And it was followed by the global financial crisis. Thankfully at the top right, you can see that didn't happen this time. They bounced exactly where they should have. And it is also an interesting curiosity that when we look back over the last oh, almost 100 years, October is the month that has the most bottoms, the most ends to bear markets. And looking forward, October and November and December have historically been the strongest years for the market over various time periods. Blue since 1950, orange over the last 20 years, purple over the last 10 years, and brown is the midterm election years, which we just had, you may know, uh, was it last week, the midterm election. And so that is also a nice thing to see. The stock market is neither expensive nor cheap. It's on 17 and a half times, which is the dotted black line running across the middle, it happens to be bang in line with the average going back to 1960. But I have a feeling that the next 12 months will be surprisingly good. And one reason I say that is something interesting happened on Thursday, the week before last, which was when the October consumer price inflation was announced. And it was at 7.7, .7, down from 8.2 in November. The market liked that. It liked it so much that the S&P went up 5.5% in that one day alone. And we can see here each of these bars is a day when the inflation report was released since 1949. Never in that history did the S&P go up so much on a day that the inflation report was released. It's also very rare for the S&P to rise 5% or more in one day. There were only 25 days that happened before since 1950. The one in brown in the middle is Thursday of the week before last, the 5.5% that you can see, percent change. Now, if we look out, I don't know, let's look out three months. That would be the column, the third in from the right. Your odds are not really high for being higher three months later because nine of those uh, 24 other instances, the market was down. But if we look out 12 months later, which is the column on the far right, only two out of the 24 were down, which I think is pretty good odds. The last thing I'll just show you is kind of fun. Here, you can see the average of the Dow Jones uh, industrial average um, in every year of the decade uh, since the year 1900. The average return of the Dow Jones in every year since 1900. And it's interesting to see that on average in the first three years of every decade, the Dow Jones went down 4.7%. But then in the next seven years, it basically doubled. And that's sort of nice to see because obviously we're about to start the year 2023. Uh, two more slides and then I'm done. Here's one. Everybody would like to know where is the leadership going to be in the market? Um, 
unlikely to be the technology companies, which were the leaders over the last 10 years. I think they've probably bottomed. Uh, we can see looking at the ARC ETF, um, which is a very famous uh, technology uh, stock ETF, that it went down from peak to trough by 78% which is exactly the same amount as the dot-coms went down after their bubble collapsed in 2000. But it took the dot-coms a long time to settle down and then start moving up again. So where could the leadership be? Well, nobody knows yet because we don't really know what the future looks like for the economy. At Julius Baer, our own forecast is there could be a 35 to 45% chance of a recession next year. Now, I don't think that means the market will go down, but it would mean the leadership among the uh, sector would be quite different depending on what the state of the economy is. So I'll just leave you with this that shows you the relative performance of, of four sectors that were underperforming the S&P over the last five years, but actually recently have broken out and have started outperforming. The two on the left are the industrials and the financials. Those are cyclical sectors, so they would react well to an economy that's getting stronger. Healthcare is a defensive sector. Biotechnology is a growth sector. I'm not sure which one will end up being the leader, but uh, these are ones which technically are showing strength. It could be, and this is my last comment, that the leadership isn't in the United States, as hard as that is uh, for us to believe, because the last 10 years have been so good for the United States. It could be the leadership is in other parts of the world, maybe even here in Asia in some countries, especially if the dollar is peaking out. With that, I'm going to stop my presentation. Thank you for your attention.